G'day Earthlings, Dr. Rank here and welcome to Gaming Legends, the show that has a dozen arrest warrants from the Semantic Police. In LEGO City Undercover, you take the role of Chase McCain, a rookie cop forced out of retirement for a game of family-friendly Grand Theft Auto. Cops are legally required to know the streets like the back of their claw hand, and that's why tonight I'm throwing Chase's eyesight in the trash. Can you beat LEGO City Undercover without the TV? For the purposes of this run, any apparatus that requires the use of a composite cable, component cable, or HDMI cable is completely banned. In other words, our goal is to reach the end credits without ever looking at the TV screen or listening to the TV speakers. I did still set up my camera to record the TV, but only so you could truly appreciate my idiocy. Of course, this task would be completely ridiculous in the PS4 and Xbox versions, and completely trivial in the Switch version. Hence why I'm doing this challenge in the original Wii U release. The game has unique video and audio outputs for the Wii U gamepad, and has the unfortunate side effect of not supporting off-TV play. Let's fix that, shall we? Surprisingly, the first roadblock is at the title screen. Turns out, its name is literal. The devs were polite enough to have sound effects play through the gamepad speakers when navigating menus, but not polite enough to show the menu itself. Thankfully, we're not entirely lost. Unless the current user account has no save data, the game will always highlight the load button and the most recent save file by default, so mashing A half a dozen times is a 100% valid strategy. Once in the game proper, you have to get from Auburn Docks to the police station, but the gamepad isn't done showing off the logo yet. We can't even tell when the cutscene is finished, let alone actually walk across the street to our car. But there is still a workaround for this. Remember when I said we couldn't use the TV speakers? Plug some headphones into the gamepad's audio jack, and the game will be legally obligated to redirect the TV's audio through them, meaning we can still listen to the outside world. It's not the most reliable navigation method, but it's all we got. That said, I do not recommend doing a blind playthrough in this blind playthrough. You'll want to have the game's map surgically installed in your brain before even starting the run. The camera starts off pointing southwest, and the destination is due south as the crow flies. As soon as you have control, move forwards into the water, then swim over to the first ladder on the left. From there, just hold up on the analog stick, jumping over the first stud-covered curb, which should get you most of the way there. Eventually, you'll get stuck in a corner, which you should realize after about a minute of silence. Move left until you reach the studs along the sidewalk, then use your whistle to stop a car. Hop into it, then floor it until you crash into the fence at the train tracks. From there, tap right once, do a few double jumps to turn the camera, then hold up. Eventually, you'll get stuck on the fence at the police station, where you can hear one of your colleagues weightlifting. At this point, try to navigate around to the right. If you hear the music from the cafe, you've gone too far. Once you find the front door, use Frank Honey's voice as a beacon for your next objectives. Fixing the computer, changing into your uniform, and, most importantly, obtaining the police scanner and installing the mandatory software update. From now on, the gamepad will show a map of the current area. It doesn't show every detail, of course, but it provides just enough information that we don't have to fumble like a complete idiot anymore. Our new strategy is clear. Stare at your phone for the entire game. The map also marks the locations of scan points, as well as suspects you're pursuing. Held items, though, aren't marked, so you will have to rely on your gut for those. The map also doesn't show much detail on the buildings, meaning you have almost no perception of your current altitude. With enough patience and strategic idiocy, we do eventually make it to the rooftops level. Special assignment levels actually have their own dedicated map, which has a much better sense of topography. One other thing we discover here is that basic combat is significantly more difficult. We can easily perform a quick throw by just matching Y, but the enemy isn't legally defeated until you arrest him. Thankfully, the three robbers in this level are completely optional, and Snake Squealer is caught during a cutscene. I did arrest all of them anyway though, which was a simple matter of following their last known trajectory. With level 1 cleared, we head to the back of the police station to unlock the data scanner. This allows us to view a basic outline of the nearby terrain from just about anywhere, as well as mark the locations of super bricks on our map. 
There are a few red brick upgrades that will make it even more useful, such as the red brick detector from Auburn Bay Bridge. Even so, it can only be used on solid ground, only provides a basic outline of the level geometry, and doesn't include destructible objects. Most of the game was a battle with my own lack of memory, and I did need to take a few recon breaks. One major priority is to gather as many super bricks as possible in the overworld. There are several mandatory super builds, some of which appear during levels. If you keep your brick count high enough, you should be able to skip most of the in-level super bricks. The Bluebell Mine gave me a bit of a scare with the skydiving section, during which the map completely disappears. But turns out skydiving is a lot easier than you think since most obstacles just bounce you off them. The only exception is the giant fan, but I somehow managed to brute force a solution. Once you beat the mines, grab some dynamite and take it to the halfway point between the level entrance and the train station. This will reveal the red brick for the clue detector upgrade. You'll still need to buy it from the shop, but once you do, the data scanner will be infinitely more useful than before. Most red bricks have to be manually enabled from the pause menu every time you boot up the game, but data scan upgrades are a notable exception. You'll also want the city challenge detector so you can easily unlock train stations for fast travel. Barry Smith's dojo starts with a super build that requires 40,000 bricks. Of the four super bricks available here, only one is easy to grab as it just requires a detective scan. The others are locked behind torch puzzles and a gyro maze, neither of which are worth my time. But luckily, that one super brick is all we need. If we quit the level and come back, our brick count will be preserved and we can recollect the same super brick infinitely. This not only gets us into the dojo proper, but also lets us farm bricks for later. I stuck around and replayed the level until I had a couple hundred thousand bricks, which should be enough to get us through the rest of the game without much effort. After joining Chan's gang in Chapter 5, we run into a major roadblock. In order to initiate the first vehicle robbery, we need to distract these guards by restoring food and music to the nearby party. And restoring the music requires us to play a rhythm game for 30 seconds without making more than 3 mistakes. Without the TV, there's no indication of when we're supposed to give input, let alone in which direction. And worst of all, the directions of the arrows are random, with over 13 billion possible patterns. No amount of cheat sheets will help us here. I asked around in the LEGO City Undercover speedrunning discord, and there doesn't seem to be any method to skip this section, especially without the remastered version's multiplayer. There is technically a method to reach the farmer outfit early, but it won't be permanently saved unless we complete certain specific story missions, none of which I have access to. But we did figure out a strategy. The Rhythm Gang can respond to diagonal D-pad inputs, and it never chooses the same direction twice in a row. Mashing a diagonal gives you a 50% chance of getting the first one right, and mashing the opposite diagonal at every correct input gives you a 66% chance of getting the next one right. But even with that strategy, it's still a 1 in 3000 chance of success overall, and while that's certainly better than 1 in 13 billion, I'd rather not quit my day job over it. So while this minigame is technically possible without the TV, I haven't invested enough time to actually do it. Feel free to try it yourself if you want, but I'm personally throwing in the towel at this point. The next few missions are thankfully much simpler, though the Chaser time trial did screw me over by not showing the finish line on the map for some reason. After busting out Mo DeLuca, we have to intercept the Color Gun shipment, which was surprisingly difficult. We have to catch up to the truck, destroy it, then drive it to Vinny's ice cream parlor all in one go. The truck is surprisingly fast during the pursuit, but its hitbox is larger than most vehicles, meaning you're more likely to hit it. That hitbox becomes a double-edged sword in the getaway phase though, especially without the ability to see oncoming traffic. After 4 or 5 tries though, I managed to intercept the truck before it even left the on-ramp and unlocked the color gun. You won't have any way to keep track of your current colour aside from short-term memory, but this shouldn't be an issue for most levels. And while the colour swappers within levels are invisible, the ones in the overworld can be tracked by the data scanner. Dirty Work has a valve puzzle requiring you to stop the wheels at the correct time, which is more difficult when you can't see them. 
Don't ask me how I was able to get the first two right in one attempt each, because I have no idea. Once we have the Emerald, it's just a simple matter of building our getaway vehicle. All that super brick grinding earlier is finally starting to pay off. Now that we're a part of the Papalado plan, I've got some real good news. Our reward for completing Chapter 6 is the ultimate weapon in the war on televisions. Photo mode. From now on, we can actually see the world around us instead of just the terrain. Upon reaching Apollo Island, however, we discover its one weakness. Somebody at Traveler's Tales was too lazy to model anything in the camera's blind spot and covered up their mistake by prohibiting flash photography during special assignments. Unfortunately for them, I managed to smuggle in my own equipment. If you hold down the R button, the game will take a screenshot of the TV and show it on the gamepad. It even pauses the game while you look at it, so we'll definitely be abusing this as much as possible. There are still a few things that it can't help with though. Astro crates require you to play Simon Says and the gamepad provides no clues. But unlike the rhythm game, the pattern always uses each colour exactly once and it remains consistent as long as you don't press B. Trial and error is a perfectly valid strategy. There is technically a red brick that completes Astro Crates automatically, but we can't even collect it without the construction outfit and by then we'll be almost done anyway. Chan's Scrapyard has another super build, but we can practically skip it thanks to our brick farming earlier. And speaking of farming, I was surprised to learn that the cornfields in Chapter 9 are actually shown on the map. The Colossal Fossil Hustle has another valve puzzle like in Dirty Work, which is significantly harder to get the timing for. Thankfully, we've got screenshots now which can help us check how close we are. Once we get into the dinosaur exhibit, we can skip straight to the T-Rex. Hot property forces us to train as a fireman, which means putting out fires. Unlike the other weapons though, the fire extinguisher shoots constantly while you hold Y, which also adjusts your character compass in real time. The trampoline section includes verbal guidance from Ramon Lopez Delgado, which basically gives us a free pass. The water cannons are hard to aim, but the water is still visible in the screenshot, letting us adjust our aim accordingly. The same is also true of the clown minigame in the station proper, though it is a more time sensitive endeavour. In Chapter 11, the game will expect you to change your colour gun from green to blue and then back to green. If you're not an idiot like me, you'll use the blue paint and then swap back immediately so you don't have to deal with the RC explosives. At the construction yard, we need to use the crane to fix the pipes. While this is mostly the same situation as the water cannon, it's a lot harder to judge the aim accurately. But as long as you remember to press Y and not A, it should be fine. There's another skydiving section in Disruptive Behaviour, which is apparently the one place in the entire game where even screenshots are forbidden. Most of it involves forward movement, though I did get stuck on the laser cannons for a while. The final shaft has rotating energy beam things, but I somehow managed to win by doing absolutely nothing. After setting fire to a skyscraper, we head back to Apollo Island for our final super build and final special assignment. There's not much platforming to speak of, and what little there is can easily be overcome with the jetpack. The circuitry puzzle is easy with screenshots, and the Rex Fury boss fight is just a button mashing extravaganza. Phase 2 makes things a bit harder by forcing us to throw people at him, but your aim should be simple if you just throw from the center. Only one more skydiving section stands between us and the end cutscene. This is the hardest one though, since in space nobody can hear you die and respawn. I got stuck here for so long, the music looped back around to Rex Fury Phase 1. But the timer doesn't actually exist until you're in the atmosphere, and by then you should already be holding B constantly. With blind skydiving established as an Olympic sport and literally 1% battery left on my phone, the LEGO City Undercover No TV Run is officially conquered, except for that rhythm game from earlier. If you want to try this run for yourself, don't. Just, just don't. Let me know if you manage to beat the rhythm game, but otherwise, I recommend watching this torture from a safe distance. If anyone needs me, I'll be playing Crash Bandicoot. See you down under.